Good morning and welcome back to the final day of the lovely retreat up here in Sheffield and we're welcoming everyone who's joining us online as well. Just a really brief introduction uh, for those of you in particular online. Um, so thank you very much for all your generosity. There's been a great amount of generosity from the people in the room here. Those of you that are online are able to go to our website anucamperproject.org forward slash donate. We are looking to raise funds for an even bigger abode so that we can move from our small vihara to a forest monastery, hopefully soon. So if you are able to give, please do give as generously as you can. And you can find all the information on our website. And there is a link to that in the comments on our YouTube. If you can volunteer your time or wish to volunteer food, Dana, you can drop an email to team at anucamperproject.org as well. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to the Venerables. You know, many years ago, when we realized we needed a bigger place, there was a, there was a big opportunity, and unfortunately we let it slip by, because, you know, we realized that Queen Elizabeth was getting old, and, <laughs> and she didn't need such a big place to live. She has many palaces, and the Buckingham Palace it's such a well-situated <laughs> place. You don't have to worry about trains, just from Victoria Station, train station, whatever. It's so easy to get. We've got lots of big grounds there for walking meditation, good security, many rooms. Wow, we could have ordained you all by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was, but unfortunately, she didn't understand the importance of making good karma before you pass away. Jan, it might be because of that comment you made to Prince, who was it? Prince Edward? No, is there a Prince Edward? <laughs> what did you say to him? No, it's just, with one of the other monks, Ajahn Sujato, we went to one of these big receptions and the Queen was there and Prince Philip and there was this other guy just standing in the background not doing anything. I felt sorry for him. So I dragged uh, Ajahn Sujato, let's talk to this fellow. And I said to him, he's losing his hair. He says, very thin on top. And I said, if you lose any more hair, I invite you to become a monk with me. <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, when we walked away, I said, who was that? That was uh, Prince Edward. <laughs> <laughs> he can't say that to a prince. Of course you can. <laughs> they don't have a Tower of London in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what am I supposed to be talking about? Yeah. Um, oh yes. Um, one thing. Okay, you asked me to say this, but so here we go. Is there's one thing which is in the suttas, and some people read it and just don't understand what it means. And it's an important part of Dhamma. You know, it's said that when the Buddha. Uh, was, f was freshly enlightened and he was thinking, what should you do next? And even though the people said, there are some with little dust in their eyes, and maybe I could teach and they might understand, but then he also said how difficult it is for people to understand such things as Sabha Sankara Samatha. And you can read that for yourself, but what it means is something quite profound, really profound. What is Sabha Sankara Samatha? You all have heard me talk about Samatha many, many times. Samatha is stilling, settling, calming till things disappear. One of the nice things about being a monastic is that you know, we have to study some of these words because this is also in our Vinaya, these are our training rules. If there's any uh, problem which we need to settle, any discussion, any disagreement, even any of our duties, that we have to find a means to settle it so that business disappears. Even that is called adhikarana samatha. Adhikarana is a business and samatha means how to settle it. And it's a beautiful word because, of course, samatha also means how you meditate. You meditate so the whole mind becomes settled, so there's no more business in there. 
So there's nothing to do, nowhere to go, no problem to solve. Everything becomes really peaceful. And there's a wonderful concept you know, in the Dhamma. One of those uh, meanings of samatha is also all the questions you know, which we have. I'm not, I thought well, there's not going to be no Q&A this afternoon, which is a shame. But then, of course, uh, even monks have to be disappointed. <laughs> no, it's just because there's many other things we have to do. But also, have you ever noticed, doesn't matter how long you give for Q&A, there's always more questions. The questions never end by answering them. But on one time, the, maybe I was six or seven years as a monk, my Thai was fluent, and I wanted to go and see one of these Thai monks called Ajahn Tate. And he was really impressive. Even when I first went to Thailand, he was in the hospital dying with cancer. The best possible doctors, nothing was working. And so he decided, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die in my home monastery. So he left the hospital in Bangkok and went up to what Him Mark Peng uh, in, uh, next to the Mekong River. And he had a nice monastery there, so he went up there to die. It's about 25 years later, he finally died. He was very stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, it wasn't stubbornness. It was just something else about these diseases which he understood and knew. But he was a very beautiful monk, a very, um, very simple, very humble, very approachable. So when I decided to go up and ask some of the questions which I had at that time, and I, I thought at the time it wasn't going to last much longer, but I went up there to ask my questions, I also had to sort of await in the queue. Everyone else had to ask, ask their questions and then I had my appointment. And after waiting for two or three days to ask my question, questions, had them all worked out what I was going to ask. And then when I went into the room, just to see him one on one. He was so peaceful, so kind, that every question I had just melted away. It just vanished. I just felt so comfortable there, I didn't need any answers, didn't need any questions. The thought did come up, and I'm being honest with you, that they're going to have to get some water buffaloes to drag me out of fear. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to die here. I'm going to stay here. You felt so accepted, so welcome, not discriminated against at all. And it's a beautiful feeling. So much peace and loving kindness. All the questions just disappeared. It's just they weren't there. And to this day, I always feel that what questions are, yes, you want to find some answers, but really they don't answer the questions fully. The best answer is you can get so peaceful, it's like your mind becomes like a very still lake. It's got no um, waves on the surface, no ripples on the surface. It's totally still and peaceful. And that's where all the questions become answered not with intellectual answers, but with the emotional answer. Your mind is not disturbed anymore. It doesn't need answers. So those sorts of um, situations, that is sometimes like sabha, sankara, samatha. Everything becomes stilled and peaceful. And there may be other things which you don't know, you don't understand, you don't have the answers for. But it doesn't matter because they're not important. You have the answer there in the stillness, in the peace, in the not wanting anything in the whole world. It's been totally peaceful in this moment. So anyway, that gives another example of what this samatha really means. From that stillness, from that peace, when nothing moves, then there's nothing to want. Nowhere to go, nothing to be. That's why, uh, of all, I know that poor old Ayachanda this morning 
She was carrying all these gifts which you gave to her. Lots and 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 lots of chocolate. I think she's got so much chocolate, she can dye her robes with that <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> but for a long time now, I've told people, if you want to offer me uh, a present, a gift, you know, for helping you out, what you can do, and it's a beautiful thing to do, is to get a little box. And inside that box, you can wrap it up with a nice little bone and put some effort into this and as much care as you possibly can. You know, to Ajahn Brahm, thank you for all the things you've done. But the most important part of that, the contents of the box, please put nothing in it. And when I open it and I see there's nothing there, that's exactly what I want. Thank you so much. Nothing. <laughs> I don't have to worry about storing it anywhere. I, I look after it to make sure I keep nothing <laughs> and I worship nothing and I respect nothing and I want for nothing and then when you have nothing it's very easy to store it away somewhere <laughs> and it never gets lost and a burglar a burglar might come in the house and they can't find it they can't take nothing they take things and if they do take things well done because I need to empty my house more and more so you should invite burglars in. They think it's a trick. <laughs> it's not, they're relieving you of stuff. So anyhow, even in this room here, is this room a bit packed for you? You're all too close together? Of course not. Have a look in this room. What do you see when you come into this room? You see people who's here there. You see the, the Buddha statue, you see the walls. You see, I don't know what else you see, the canvas. How many of you, when you come to this room, see nothing? The space between each one of you. The space between you sitting here and the ceiling, between the walls. There's more space in this room than there are things. But we become so used to seeing things, never seeing spaces. If you can see spaces, there's hardly anything here. There's this huge amount of emptiness, and then there's you. And if you look at you, inside you, there's so much emptiness <laughs> between your ears. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Why do you keep feeling this, this? Have you ever seen a brain? One of the things which I did is, uh, as a monk, as a young monk, we could go and see autopsies. And that was just so surprising. The first time you saw a brain you know, taken out from the skull. It's so small. And it causes so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that idea of respecting nothing, emptiness, when things disappear, that was very important for me because what it meant was even when we are here why are you here what are you getting from this if you're wise you say nothing you're getting more and more nothing you're disappearing things are vanishing you're becoming lighter it's one thing to see just how much stuff we carry in bags. But <laughs> or like your computers. I've got a little laptop. Not laptop, it's what's called tablet. What's my favorite switch? No, delete. <laughs> it is. I love the delete switch. <laughs> And so many years ago, they gave me this little machine for my heart. And I love this machine. It's called the Shredder. <laughs> People can write these letters. You get, get these forms and certificates or whatever. And you put them in the Shredder. That's why I said to you yesterday, if I die, that's what I would like to do. I don't think I fit in the Shredder. 
Why is it that people have so much worship for a body? That you know, you have to go and take it to a crematorium or take it to bury it somewhere. And that's just environmentally just so destructive. So wouldn't it be wonderful just to put your, your body, leave it in the forest to dry for a few days? Why not? That's what happens to the kangaroos and other animals. And then little by little, it can be shredded. Or even be better than that, food for the ants. Now the ants just by chance, every now and again you tread on them and now you can say sorry and give your body, feed them. Wouldn't that be nice? Could you do that? No, oh, okay. Anyway, that's not what I was, got, that's not what I was supposed to talk about. <laughs> what? Okay. So, yeah? There's another machine that you like a lot. The, the, the kettle to make a cup of tea? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? The little um, thing with the switch. Oh, yeah, that one, yeah. yeah. That's... I read about this years and years and years ago. Apparently the first model was invented in San Francisco. It became a, a cultural phenomenon. This had this little box and you put it on your coffee table. And it's a little box, it just had a switch on the top. No one knew what it was for. So it was a conversation piece. They said, well, just turn it on, see what happens. So they, <laughs> I think you understand it. You turned it on and the little um, lid came up and then little hand or a fake hand came out, turned it off, <laughs> went back again and it all closed up. That's his whole purpose. <laughs> Whoever turned it on, it got turned off again. <laughs> and that reminded me just how, what a beautiful simile of life. You turn it on and it turns itself off. <laughs> so I called it the enlightenment machine. <laughs> the dumb machine. <laughs> so it's not hardly worthwhile turning on, is it? If it's going to turn itself off again. So that's one of the reasons why it's not worth getting reborn. You're only going to die again. How many, how many times do you want to do this? You're crazy. So once you see what's going on, there was this, it's nice ama amassing stories. People know I'm weird, so every now and again people come and tell me these weird stories. And one of these weird stories was this uh, couple in Perth, they were Australian couple, Caucasian. And they came to see me because I was a Buddhist and because they thought if I told anybody else they said, they'd probably take us to hospital and, and, and commit us to an asylum because when they had their second child, as soon as the second child came home from the hospital with its mother, and it was in the little uh, param, or whatever you call it these days, I still don't know the name of that word, but anyway, it was in the pram, and the older brother, go and say good night to your baby brother, uh, Paul. So the elder brother, Peter, went over there, said good night, Paul. He was only about, five weeks or four weeks old, and the young baby straight out of hospital said, good night, Peter. Has that ever happened to you? What would you think? Would you think that you imagine this? But there was two of them there, they both heard it. And so they just stared in awe and wonder and shock. What's going on? They both heard it, clearly. And then their eldest son, who's only about three or four or something, said again, good night, Paul. And this time with both of them looking and focusing, the little baby said, good night, Peter, a second time. And they kind of, as you would, freak out. What's going on? This is not a joke, this is true. And so that's why they came and saw us. They said, you're Buddhist, what's going on? And we told them that this is like, what happens, what we call at death, terminal lucidity, this is similar but not as common, is like terminal lucidity at sort of birth, where a person you know, can even speak. 
There was another case of that some time ago. This person, uh, when he was born, he walked seven steps and said, I am the best in this world. I am the last of my last birth. Who was that? <laughs> the Buddha. <laughs> That's what he said. I never believed that before. But when you see these things happening uh, in our modern world, there's some things which is quite challenging. What's happening there is a brain is not competent to, to create any speech. This is the mind working. The mind and the brain are two separate things. This is one of the reasons why when you start to um, get into deep meditation, your mind begins to take over. Your brain gets subdued with all the five senses. This is one of the reasons why when people do CT scans of a person when they're meditating, sometimes they get two flat lines. Not just the ECG, but the EEG as well. And that happened to this one guy, his name was Greg. For years I never said his name because I didn't want to embarrass him. But it was many years ago now. He would only meditate for maybe 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And one Sunday afternoon, there was nothing on the TV. So he just went to his bedroom, told his wife, I'm just going to meditate for a little while. And after about an hour and a half, he still hadn't come out of the bedroom. So his wife went to check on him. When she went to check on him, she couldn't see him breathing. She freaked out. She called the emergency services, which in Australia are zero, zero, zero. Don't call 999 over there, you get in big trouble. Zero, zero, zero. And within a few minutes, an ambulance came. It was a Sunday afternoon, not much business. The medics came out of the ambulance. They checked him. No pulse, no breath. It looked like he was dead. So they put him in the stretcher, put him in the back of the ambulance. His wife accompanied him to the hospital. She was obviously freaking out. She thought her husband had died. And they took him in there to the triads and the very fortunate, the, nurse, the doctor on duty in the emergency department that day was an Indian descent. Grown up in uh, Australia, but his parents had migrated from India. They at least knew a little bit about spirituality. He had heard that some of these people can suspend their life faculties through meditation. So he decided just to to not give up yet. And it's interesting that it, he told me this before he knew that this was in the Chula Vedala Sutta. He said the doctor carried on because there was something, one thing which was quite strange. Even though they put on an ECG on him, there's no heartbeat, flat line, an EEG, another flat line, there was no brain activity. The one thing which was anomalous was that his body was warm. Now please remember that. If you see Aya Chanda one day sitting there and you think she's dead because they you know, can't see her breathing and she's sitting there for hours, please just touch her just to check if she's warm. If she's warm, don't cremate her yet. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, this is all about uh, resting in peace before you die. You're not dead yet. You're just in a very deep state of meditation. So anyway, what do you do next? In those days, uh, they gave uh, this um, Greg defibrillators, electric shocks they put on his chest. Doctors tell me they don't do that anymore. They shoot you up with adrenaline or something. But anyway, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a doctor. So they put the defibrillators on them. I saw that in documentaries. It's electric shocks, boom! And you, you sh get shocked, you jump off the table for a, for a couple of inches. It didn't work. Again, boom! 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 Many times, nothing worked. 
And I always say it's really fortunate they never sent him down to the morgue yet. Because imagine if they sent him down to the morgue and then he came out of his meditation in the morgue rather than in the emergency room, a couple of morgue attendants would have had heart attacks and died. Because <laughs> that's what happened. He came out of his meditation, he opened his eyes. I interrogated him on this. Are you sure? Yes, yes, yes. And when he came out of his meditation, what am I doing in the hospital? I was in my bedroom. <laughs> Gave him a thorough examination, absolutely nothing wrong with him at all. And just he walked home with his wife. They didn't even keep, even keep, him, in, keep him in overnight. It was perfectly okay. And I did ask him, during that time, what was happening? He said, I was blissed out. A wonderful time, but I was totally unaware of anything, uh, any of the five senses. Just in the realm of the sixth sense. Really blissed out. Was there anything unpleasant about that experience at all? Could you feel the defibrillators? No, I couldn't feel them. I couldn't hear all the sirens of the ambulance as I was rushed to hospital. I couldn't notice any of that. The five senses were, were turned off. He said there was one unpleasant part of that experience. The scolding he got from his wife on the, on the way home. <laughs> Don't you ever do that again. I was scared silly. I thought you died. <laughs> Poor. <laughs> Poor man. <laughs> and man as well. <laughs> so anyhow, these things actually do happen. It's because they do happen is one of the reasons why I talk about this. There was this one lady in Penang years ago. My disciples in Penang, I usually give a retreat there once every couple of years. And so they, they asked me, can you please do some counselling? This lady, she's been to all of the uh, psychologists and psychiatrists you know, here in Malaysia, also in Kuala Lumpur, and none of them can help her. She thinks she's been possessed or something weird has gone on. And uh, so I just talked to her, and I was really so pleasantly pleased. What had happened, she'd fluked the jhana. She pressed the letting go button, whatever you call it, without all of this hard work which you do, three-day retreat, <laughs> keeping <laughs> silent, <laughs> hardly eating. <laughs> the, she had done, I forget what she was doing, but you know, she went into one of these jhanas almost spontaneously. And then she was telling me, you know, I said, what happened? Describe it. And as she was describing it, it was like inside, I thought, oh yeah, I know this. And I said, what you got there was the first jhana. And I also added a few more details. And she said, yes, yes. She was very excited. At last, someone understands what she'd been through. It was totally pleasant. It was just she didn't understand what it was. And that was confusing to her. And so because of that, that's why I find it really important to teach these things. Even if you feel you're such a long way away from jhanas. You aren't that far. As I said earlier, it's like, just open the petal, a few more layers of petals, open the lotus, and then it's just there. And it's important for you to have that confidence. So often, some people who meditate, they say, Ajahn Brahm, why do you talk about jhanas? And I just want to have a bit of peace, that's all. It's me, I'm, I'm, I don't meditate that much. You know, maybe so sort of in my next lifetime, but not now. Sometimes you don't know how close you are. You remember one of those stories about the migrant who came to UK? He came to UK from one of these countries which were war-torn. He was a doctor in his home country. When he came here, his, his uh, uh, experience and... and uh, uh, education were not recognised by the NHS here. And that even happened of, in Australia once. Uh, there was uh, the College of Psychiatry, which you know, runs and oversees psychiatrists in Australia. 
uh, there was an American psychiatrist invited by one of the universities in Sydney you know, to teach and help out. But then the uh, College of Psychiatry said, well, he's not authorised to teach in Australia. He did all his degrees over in the United States. He had to do another little um, examination. So they gave him two books to study, and they were going to examine him on those two books afterwards. When they gave him the first of those two books, he told the, this College of Psychiatry, whose name is on that book as the author? <laughs> That's me! I wrote that book. <laughs> you see how stupid some people could be <laughs> in Australia. But anyway, so this poor doctor's his, his degree was not recognised. So all he could do until he could you know, eventually get enough money to sort of try and get some exams so he could become a doctor again, he got to work on a building site. And on a building site, he worked really hard on Monday. He was young, fit, could do stuff. And on the first day, he worked really hard. When he went home, how much did you earn today, darling, said his wife. Nothing. Zero. And I worked really hard. And that's really unfair. In UK, you discriminate against migrants. We went to work on Tuesday, worked hard then. Wednesday worked really hard. Thursday worked hard. And he was about to give up. Four days of working hard, no pay at all. But he wasn't doing anything else on Friday, so his wife sent him off and he went to the building site, hardly worked hard at all. And then the boss asked him to come into the office and gave him this big pay packet. And then he finally worked out what to do. He went home and told his wife, from now on, I'm only going to go to work on Friday. <laughs> 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 on payday. <laughs> But of course, you know, you get paid on Friday for all the work you did on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday as well. Just like in meditation. Every now and again you get payday. You get a nice meditation. If you haven't got payday yet, don't worry, the check's in the mail. <laughs> but what it really meant was that sometimes you meditate and meditate and don't get anywhere and meditate and meditate and you think it's not working for you and meditate and meditate and it's usually when you least expect it you get the paycheck and there's so many beautiful stories one of those beautiful stories I was teaching a meditation retreat I often say this story because it's, it's just really sweet it's a very nice memory which I have of this event teaching a meditation retreat in Kaulak, that's just outside of Phuket. And then everybody was meditating for nine days. It was actually a very cheap hotel because it's just after the tsunami. So they're trying to get people to, to come in and we, we hired this hotel, very, very good price. So anyway, this lady, she was meditating and meditating, being very diligent, nine days. At the end of the nine days, getting nowhere. So that's when, you know, the retreat finished. We did the loving kindness meditation and gave the final blessing. And I was just relaxing, having a, 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 an apple juice or something. And then uh, she came to see me. The retreat had finished about an hour earlier and she had a, a taxi book to take her to the airport to fly back home. And then, she had an hour to kill. I, from this time on, I love that word, an hour to kill. Even though I keep my precepts, you don't kill, kill time. But nevertheless, what that meant for her, she'd been meditating for so much and so long, and she decided just to go there and relax to the max, kill time. And because she wasn't trying to get some meditation, she wasn't trying to be still, she just let go. And then she came to see me after the hour's meditation. And I can never forget her face. I was sitting on a chair like this and she was on the ground with her hands up like this. Ah, 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 oh, oh, alas, oh, 
at a bar. It's, 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 it's so wonderful. It's the first time she got a big meditation. And the afterglow was kind of really sweet and cute. <laughs> She's a bhikkhuni now. <laughs> she never expected to get the full enlightenment, not full enlightenment, the, the deep meditation at all. Because she never expected it, she'd been trying all this time, she gave up and then it happened. Even better than that, Ananda. I call this the Ananda method of enlightenment. This is you know, Ananda the Buddha's <laughs> attendant. 25 years he'd been with the Buddha. 25 years he'd been seeing all these other people coming up to the Buddha and you know, Buddha saying, yeah, that was the first jhana, the second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, all this enlightenment experience. He'd seen all of this. And he hadn't got enlightened yet. He was a stream winner, but nothing more than that. And he thought that, oh my goodness, if I'm, I'm right next to the Buddha and I can't do it, what hope is there for me now? But anyway, I think you all know the story. Uh, after the Buddha passed away, all the Arahats, they decided to meet together, the Arahats, the enlightened ones, all meet together and gather all the teachings together so they can keep on reciting it, so it is authentic. They can preserve it, you know, for, even for today, before even they wrote it down in books. They were chanted and chanted and chanted and chanted. And anyway, Ananda was so well, had a, such a good memory and had heard so many teachings, he, be, he was invited to this meeting, even though he wasn't enlightened. 500 enlightened beings, actually 499 plus Ananda. Imagine how it would feel if at the end of this retreat that Ayachanda made the announcement that all the people on this retreat had all got enlightened except for you. <laughs> Even your partner was enlightened but not you. That would be really hard to bear, wouldn't it? Oh, this is not fair. <laughs> so anyway, that's what it felt like for Ananda. So the night before the meeting, five, 499 hours bus Ananda, he decided to give it everything he got. Meditate all night, walking, sitting, walking, sitting. This was important for him walking, sitting, walking, sitting, and then eventually the dawn came up. He still wasn't enlightened. <coughs> and so what did you do? He gave up. Maybe, you know, it's not possible for me to get enlightened in this life. Do you ever think like that? Each one of you, well, maybe monks and nuns, but me, there's so many things in this world. You know, I'm, I am uh, not male, not female, I'm bi, or gender different. Maybe there's something in my way. You think you can't. That's what Ananda felt. But then, Ananda decided it's only about an hour to go before the meeting. I'll take a nap. So he wanted to take a nap because he couldn't get enlightened. And just before his head hit the pillow, he became the 500th Arahat. He gave up. Enlightenment came towards him. If you want to know how that works, there's a, one of my favorite stories is about the donkey. Donkeys are very stubborn. If you think you've got a wife who's stubborn, or a husband who's stubborn, get a donkey. <laughs> That's what sometimes they call you, as stubborn as a donkey. Because if you get a stick to try and move a donkey, the donkey won't move. You can hit it as hard as you don't hit it, because that's cruel. But instead you have the stick and you tie it to the donkey's neck. 
So the front of the stick is two foot in front of the donkey's head. On the end of the stick, you put a string. On the end of the string, you put, this is um, Sheffield. So what do you do in Sheffield? You put a uh, fish and chips. <laughs> What's a favorite food or fruit in, in Sheffield? Pie. Pie, that's good, excellent, very good choice. <laughs> so on the, end, on the end of the string, you put a pie. So the donkey can see the pie, can smell the pie. So what does the donkey do? It goes towards the pie. When the donkey moves towards the pie, then the stick moves, the string moves, and the pie moves. And the pie is always roughly two foot in front of the donkey's mouth. You can almost get it, but you just can't actually reach it. Just like many of the things you aspire for in life. You're the perfect partner, the perfect job, perfect health. Sometimes you get so close, but you can't actually just finally reach it. Like, you know, deep meditation. That's what deep meditation, sometimes you can see a limit to that. It's a limit to that, and you go towards it and it vanishes. So, the donkey chases after that pie. Chases and chases and chases, runs as hard as that donkey can. And then what happens? The donkey actually runs past the Quaker Center here in Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> and he hears this monk <laughs> telling about this story. And it learns how to catch the pie. So simple. So the donkey, it's been running really fast, stops stops. And what happens next? <laughs> the pie just swings further away from the donkey, further than it's ever been before, four foot in front of the donkey's mouth. That's why sometimes when people do the meditation properly, according to Ayah Chandra's instructions, sometimes you think it's not working, it's getting worse, I'm getting more tired, more sleepy, more things in my mind. Please have a bit of patience and confidence. That's what the donkey does. It swings four foot away from its mouth and then a strange thing happens. Weird. Now the pie starts moving towards the donkey. And it's soon it's the usual space, usual distance, two foot in front of its mouth. But the first time in the donkey's life, that pie is coming full speed towards the donkey's mouth. <laughs> And as it comes really close, there's one more instruction which it learns from this retreat. <laughs> the kindness. The doggy has to remember right at the very end, Pi, the door of my mouth is open to you. <laughs> Without that kindness, <laughs> that pie just bounces over its teeth, off its teeth. Have you ever seen how big donkey's teeth are? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to open them first of all. That's why I tell jokes, so you can exercise in opening your mouth. <laughs> and that's how the donkey catches the pie. That's how you catch jhanas and enlightenment. You've been running after it for such a long time. Stop. See what happens. First of all, it gets worse. Wait. Then all these amazing things start coming towards you. All you're doing is practicing kindness and stillness. <coughs> and it comes right to you. Surprises you sometimes. Okay. Well, I was, I did promise, not, not bad, 10.18 instead of 10.15. Is that good enough? Very good. Excellent. <laughs> So that's how to become enlightened. Easy. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> okay, what we do now? Just a little stretch. Okay. I never knew that. 
the, f the favourite food of Sheffield is the pie. There you go. Yeah. That'll do. I thought it would do. <laughs> oh no. There's still time. <laughs> Okay. You can do the guided med. So I've got to do it. Oh my goodness. Open the door of your heart. Yeah. That is not. This is not a joke. This is true. I can't teach in silence. Joking. Yeah. So over in Adelaide. One of the disciples was looking for my book, Opening the Door of Your Heart. And they looked in the bookshop, they couldn't find it. You know why? Because they had displayed it in the uh, medicine section <laughs> for heart surgery. <laughs> Honest, when they told me, I said, keep it there. <laughs> Yeah, open the door of your heart, that's what it said. You're doing the guided meditation? Yes. Yeah, am I okay? I just do what I'm told. <laughs> yeah, okay. What's that? Tissues. Yes. Okay, yeah. Just okay? Yeah, sure. Can you open the door of your nose? No worries. <laughs> Maybe we can this afternoon teach Ananda guided meditation, being your own pillow. I thought you were going to sit over there. Nope. You get a bit of view. Oh yeah, you're really neat. Very good. <laughs> Can you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> you know I learned this, I actually practiced it in front of a mirror <laughs> every morning for a couple of years. Why not? <laughs> Some people feel I'm crazy, I think it's pretty true. <laughs> you do that, Ajahn, if I come to an interview and I say I'm not laughing enough. Yeah. You've done that before. Yeah. I end up laughing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's good for your health. Look, one of the biggest problems right now is like COVID, it's like a SARS-based disease. And because of that, it's because you've got a weak um, respiratory system. Every time you laugh, you exercise your respiratory system. So the more times you laugh... <laughs> you can see the exercise that gives <laughs> for your lungs. We should get sponsored by the health department in Sheffield. <laughs> okay, stop encouraging me. <laughs> she can't stop now. She's got the giggles. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I 
This is <laughs> laughing meditation. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what have I started? That's why I invited a dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <coughs> but on a serious note. <laughs> <laughs> no, they turned off now. <laughs> Can I just say one thing? No. Uh, Go on. Uh, well, it was <laughs> it's probably not funny. <laughs> Yes, it I is. I also went to Sunday school because my best friend's uh, mom was Christian, so we both went and we tried to play badminton with them. Anyway, we used to crap off into giggles and we'd be giggling and giggling and giggling and the, the vicar came up to us and he went... <laughs> 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 he, like, took him to smile and he threw it in the bin. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it just killed ourselves. Yeah. Anyway, so don't try that. <laughs> No. Right. Um, uh, yeah, seriously, that uh, when you have some happiness, when you start meditation, it makes the meditation so much easier. That's why a few times, you know, you've heard amazing talk by, say, an Ajahn Chah, inspires you so much that when you close your eyes, it's like the mind just has this beautiful joy and happiness in it. And even if you start watching your breathing, it becomes a joyful breath. It's just the way the mind looks and it sees happiness. It sees inspiration. And that inspiration is never to be abandoned. It's beautiful how you can see that people just on a retreat, there's no entertainment except from the nuns and me. <laughs> and just how that I can entertain our mind and keep it so peaceful and happy. So right now, how do you feel? Don't know about you, but Sometimes when it's peaceful and silence, I love that. It's like people are giving me a gift, the opportunity to be still. I don't have to do anything. No one's going to judge me. No one's going to assess me or throw me out. <coughs> I don't need to fulfill anybody else's expectations. I don't have to fulfill my own expectations. I've got nothing to achieve. Nowhere I need to go. Nothing I need to get. All I do is stop. Stop and take the opportunity to be still. I give myself this as a gift, the gift of stillness, which I give to Ajahn Brahm and share to each one of you. And I give myself the gift of silence, I don't need to think. Can if I didn't want to. But the most beautiful sound in the whole world is where nothing moves. It's like the universe stops for me. When the universe stops, all that busyness, what I have to do next, 
where you have to go this evening, what you have to do to get a meal. All of that future stuff, sometimes when I see it for what it is, you get a sense of not wanting anything to do with the future unless you really, really, really have to. And right now you don't have to at all. So if the future comes up, fine. If it doesn't come up, even more fine. And as for my past, I did the best I could. Maybe I could have done better. Maybe because of my silly jokes, I offend people. But I forgive me. I forgive you. I forgive the whole world. I don't expect the world to be perfect. In fact, I always remember being a forest monk, never ever seeing a perfect tree in the forest, only bent crooked ones. And many trees which were damaged, another tree hit it, or a fire burnt it. Those damaged, crooked, twisted trees are honestly my favourites. They belong. I will never ever try and get rid of them. And they're beautiful. So what that means is you don't have to improve yourself. Just be. Make peace with who you are and how you feel. I call this relaxing to the max. That's why I love meditation. It's just relaxation, only to a far deeper level than most people imagine possible. So I relax my body right now. It's all body. Over 72 years, and it's still pretty healthy. Thank you. Because I'm at peace with my body, it's so easy to be aware of it, to be mindful of it. My body doesn't want to hide anything. It's almost like my body is saying, come and check me out. Check out my legs, my butt, my back, and my head. Because I've done this for such a long time, if there's any, any tightness or tension anywhere in my body, I can be aware of it pretty quickly. And I know exactly what to do, which is just giving it kindness. To take away all pressure, all stretching, squashing, extending. I let it be. I let it relax. So I relax part of my body, part by part, until my body gets really, really, really relaxed. Just as an example, I can feel my shoulders being quite tense right now. So I'm just going to let my arms hang a bit more loosely. And my awareness is on my shoulders. And I, I can, honestly, I feel it relaxing more and more and more. I learn how to relax. And already, <laughs> when I relax the body, 
there's always this beautiful feeling of relaxation. It's the pleasure of relaxation. It just came quite quickly today. It feels great. I feel great. The pleasure in the whole body, that everything is in a good position. It means I don't have to do any more work on my body. Just like you get all of your jobs done. You can have a free afternoon or a free weekend. And that's, there's a joy in that. A sense of like being freed from a jail. The body will not tell me what to do from here on in. Because I've dealt with the body. It's relaxed and peaceful. So what happens next is the body vanishes. Not totally. Because today I invite my breathing in. I don't focus on the breath. I just let the mind watch the breath if it wants to. No force, no compulsion, just an invitation. And if the mind wants to wander away, fine. And come back to the breath later. There's no force. Because my goal is to be a friend to my breathing. If it's a, regarded as a really good friend, we hang out together. So I'm just hanging out with my breath right now. We know each other so well. So when I'm with my breath, the breath doesn't tense up, it relaxes even more. That's why the breath starts to appeal delightful, appear delightful. See the middle of the breaths and the end of each breath. I don't force this. It's not a goal to achieve, but a landmark on the journey. It shows you shows me how relaxed I am. And I give enough time, as long as the mind requires, to get so close to the breath that everything else tends to vanish and disappear. Even the rest of my life, all the past, all the years ahead of me, all the places outside the Quaker Center in in Sheffield, all those vanish. I'm just here now with one of my best friends, my breathing. I have the confidence to relax. I know that the more I relax, the more my breath stays. When I get tight, tense, and try and lock the breath in, of course it will fly away. I have kindness towards my breathing. Don't make it strong breath or, or a short breath. The breath does what the breath wants to do. I just do the watching, the friendship, the mindfulness and kindness. <coughs> and I never think, what's the next stage of meditation? I'm just staying at this stage. And after a while, quite naturally, 
when all the causes and conditions are ripe, you go into the deeper stage of meditation. Like you go inside where you are now. These petals which are open now, open further to, to reveal what's inside. What's inside this moment? And I never judge any moment, especially not with a fault-finding mind. I'm just happy that I can be with my breath. Thank you. I never feel that it should get deeper. Come on, get deeper. I'm not demanding. It says in the Metta Sutta, let them be humble and not conceited, not proud and demanding in nature, easily satisfied. I remember those words, easily satisfied and not demanding. I'm satisfied with this. Thank you. I'm not demanding. If something more comes, wonderful. If not, wonderful. I appreciate this moment. And from this level of appreciation now, I'm kind to whatever I'm with. No need to intellectualize where you are or how it's going. Rely more on your emotional sensitivity to know what peace is. And know that when you feel confident, no fear, kind, safe, in good company, that helps you let go. You soon realize you don't have to do anything. You just watch a kind and your lotus opens up by itself. I will be quiet now until close to the end of the meditation.
getting close <coughs> to the end of the meditation now. Please keep your eyes closed. How do you feel inside? Can you notice the beauty of physical relaxation and mental peace of mind? For you, what worked and what didn't work? Now I invite you to slowly, gently open your eyes. And feel a beautiful sense of gratitude for having able to have sat quietly in peace. Peace which is available for you any time, any place. There we go. Now we have some walking meditation for people. What do we do? Optional. Oh yeah. If you're nice and peaceful, just stay down here. Sorry? Yeah. If you're happy here, just stay, but for those who are leaving, to actually to do walking meditation, be very sensitive to the person sitting next to you. They may want to just carry on sitting with their eyes closed. <coughs> 